I want to talk today about uh, having missional love, and part, partly it's just something God's been talking to me about. So even as I share this, if you could receive me as a fellow traveler on this and not as an expert, I would appreciate it. Um, but also because this is a part of my heart for at least how I want to help influence the church in the new building is to help us grow missionally in my capacity as much as I can. And I want to start by talking about this idea of missional love. And we're going to be reading out of the book of Philippians, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. But before we do that, I want to do something. And it's going to seem a little bit dramatic or cheesy, I think. But I think if you follow along with me, it'll make sense. Uh, the book of Philippians is many people's favorite book, or at least some of our favorite verses in the Bible are from the book of Philippians, such as, you know, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Does anybody have that one? It's like the most popular verse in the Bible app or something like that. And so there's lots of great verses in here. And it can feel like a very cheerful book, which is a good thing. But one of the things that I think I can forget, and perhaps you forget too, is that the Apostle Paul writing this book by the Holy Spirit when he did was actually in prison at the time as he was encouraging the church. So I need some help. I'll just get you to do it, Greg, because you've already been working this morning. Can you zip tie my hands together, yeah. please? <laughs> okay. Okay. Sure. This is how they do it. I've seen cops before. Does anybody want to start doing bad boys with me? No, a little bit tighter. Got to feel it. Good. Now can you do my legs? Yes. <laughs> bad boys, bad boys. You're going to do you're going to have to do one for each leg, maybe loop together. What you going to do? Nobody going to give you no breaks. Okay. Or you want me to take a third wider? A little bit wider probably. I don't want to fall over. I don't want <laughs> This is bad boys. This isn't I've fallen and I can't get up. You know what I mean? <laughs> Okay, good. You can do it. That, that'll do good. I don't think that'll come off. All right, and then if you could do the rope around my waist. <laughs> you just need like a lasso around my waist. You couldn't have undone this before? I, well, that would make it too <laughs> easy. This isn't church, isn't supposed to be easy. Yeah, yeah, like that. That's good. Yeah, and make a loop. It's got to stay, so... Okay, good. Okay, good. And then do you want to just take the end with you to where you're sitting? Try. You can do it. Come on. We've got a little Cub Scout action going on this morning. Amen. That's actually in here. There we go. You can work on it. All right, so... The guy who wrote this letter, what we're about to read in a second, looked a lot like this while he was reading it. He would have been bound, probably shackled. His hands may have been bound. Um, most likely, he didn't actually write this book with his own hands, but would have dictated it to somebody else who was visiting him. And almost for sure, for sure, for sure, he would have been chained or roped or guarded by someone from the Praetorian Guard, which was the Caesar's elite guard, to make sure he didn't run away. And so that's why Greg has the rope. So if I start misbehaving, he can just give this thing a solid tug and let me know who's boss. All right. So before I start reading Philippians 2, I want to share with you my heart behind the mission and the idea of thinking about missional love and the idea of cost and expectations in relationship. Was anybody here when my brother came to visit church a few weeks ago? Anybody get a little freaked out by that? It just seemed really strange. We were very identical, identical twins, and I enjoyed him very much. And, you know, we wanted to make the most of his visit. Um, it's, it's always a blessing and a treat whenever a family member comes out to Manitoba because most people in the world try not to have to come here, <laughs> especially in the winter. And so it's always a treat. And so we, as a family, we were doing our best. We were praying into it. We gave Tom uh, the master bedroom so that, because sometimes when he'd visit, he'd be in the family room on our hide-a-bed, but then, you know, he'd have to pack up each day and so the kids could go and trash the room and then we'd clean it up. And so we gave him the master bedroom so we wouldn't have to pack up after himself every day. You know, we made some special dinners and we made 
sure to get out of the house and try to give him a good time. Which is really funny because my brother's really easygoing. So uh, halfway through the trip, Tom and I went out and, and Tom said to me, you know, I don't care about all this stuff that you're doing. Right? I, I just need a couch and I'm happy. And like, yeah, that's not the point. Um, and he's an uncle and so he doesn't have any kids. And so, you know, we were just happy with him however he was. And if he did something that didn't kind of fit in with maybe family culture, we, we just totally would overlook it because we wanted to, him to have a good time and we wanted him to have an experience of Christ. And I was driving him to the airport. I think this is when it happened. My memory's a bit fuzzy. I feel like where the rope is, it makes me feel a little bit fat. Can, can you come down here maybe put it a little bit lo- oh, Okay, fine. It's just like right above my belly button, and then the, the pastor pouch is underneath the rope. And oh, man. That's a bit better. Can I get it over? Oh, hey, that's it. It was just uncomfortable. Thank you. That's your, your very good, gracious prison guard. You're a very gracious prison guard. Um, anyhow, we. I was driving him to the airport or driving back from the airport and I was just kind of thinking about how um, we'd really put our hearts into blessing him so that he could experience the kindness of Christians, essentially. We were willing to pay quite a cost to give him a good time and we were willing to overlook and hit a lot if we needed to. He's wonderful, so we didn't actually need to do lots, but we were willing to drop our expectations of home life quite a bit just to give him a good time. And when I was thinking about this, I, I felt like I had this conviction, like, do you do that with your family? Like, does Jackie have that same experience of you, where you ramp up your willingness to pay a cost and ramp down your expectations so that someone can experience the love of Jesus. And I would, I'm still not recovering from that conviction. Like, I'm still, like, m- responding to that thought that, you know, I could be so joyfully treating one person with such gospel love and then have a different expectation for somebody else who I live with And so that's kind of the heart behind this, this idea of like willingness to just suffer costs to give somebody an experience of Jesus and to drop your expectations of them and the selfish expectations of them so that you're overlooking a lot with the hopes that their life in Christ will be much better because of you. And then realizing that there's many, many, many situations where I don't live like that. That's why I'm saying I'm a fellow traveler. I'm really just learning this stuff. And as we're thinking about this, I'm just brought to the book of Philippians. And so here's Paul in jail. This is uncomfortable. Do we have it almost right? No, it's bad. Is it not tight enough? Is that the problem? No, it's just shaky. You can show me how we're really supposed to do it after the message. We have a professional in the room. So anyhow, um, this is what the apostle Paul writes about Christ. And I think if you listen to this, you can think about the cost Christ paid and his expectations of people while he was willing to do that. There we go. Okay. So he's writing to Christians and he says, so if there are any, there is any encouragement in Christ, and he's assuming there is, any comfort from love, so we're getting Christ's love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one another. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among you, yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, which means a thing to be clutched or held on to or demanded, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in... (laughs) 
human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, I'm going to do that again. But being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, because he's in jail somewhere. He's not in Philippi. He's in jail somewhere. He's saying, you guys obeyed me and the Lord when I was there, so how much more now that I'm gone doing this? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. These were the very words of God. Can you pray with me? Father, I just give you myself here. You know, I put myself in this little situation. It's really nothing. I can't imagine physically or emotionally or mentally what Paul's situation was like when he was writing this uplifting letter. And Lord, I, I hear these words about Christ's humility, and I, again, I mentally and emotionally, I don't, I'm, I'm incapable of getting the humility of Christ in it. But would you help me? Would you help us? Father, I pray you'd speak to us about growing in missional love where we'd be willing to ramp up our own personal costs to do other people good and to drop wherever able our self-centered expectations of people in order to give them a greater experience of Christ for their good. In Jesus' mighty name, I ask these things. Amen. So I thought it'd be wise to start by just reminding us if we're going to think about relationships of these terms of, terms of cost and expectation, it's good to remind ourselves that God really does have the right to have unlimited expectations of us as his creatures. Before there was anything, there was just God forever. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for his good pleasure and for his glory, he made everything. And at the height of his creation, I would flip to Genesis to read it, but I can't. Um, on that sixth day, he made male and female in his image, and he gave them a task to represent him in the world and to glorify him by having lots of babies and filling the world full of little image bearers. And he gave them this charge, and the next chapter he gave them another charge as well. And if you think about it, he has every right to expect us to do whatever he wants in the same way that you kind of have the right, if you go buy an iPhone, that it would work for you that it would charge when you charge it, it would run when it should run, the app should function the way it should function, and that, you, you know, if your phone starts freaking out and you're pocket dialing people at the wrong time and all that stuff, you get frustrated with it because you have this expectation that it would do what you want it to because it's yours. Does that make sense? And because God's our creator and made us, he actually has this right to have unlimited expectations of us, that we would always obey him and always trust him and always do, his good, do him good and always do what's in his best interest and serve him like we want things to serve us. Uh, I have this sewer pump in my house right now that does not serve me, and it loses its prime almost every day. And sometimes I fix it real easy-like. But the last time it got, this, it got super hot because I didn't get to it right, and as I was opening up the priming valve, it released this nice steaming cloud of gray water into my face. And I had my mouth open. <laughs> that thing was not serving my best interests. And it didn't even care. sinner. But if you think, can we think about this for a bit? Like from God's perspective, if we were God and we made the world and we made it just good and we made these creatures in our image to love and be loved and to do us good and receive blessing in return, 
wouldn't you expect them to work with you and serve you and be good to you and be faithful to you and do what you, you, you tell it to? Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you have pretty high expectation of these things that you made for this purpose? And the sad story of, of the world is that our first parents didn't meet that expectation, which is a right expectation. It's not a false or bad one. And instead rebelled against God. They, they were tempted with the potential of becoming gods themselves that didn't need to depend on their creator, and they took it. And they did get independent of him, but they didn't really become gods, and now everybody dies. And the Bible tells us we're born with this thing in our hearts, called either called indwelling sin, sometimes called the flesh, and we have this bent in us to always want to turn away from trusting God and to trust ourselves and and uh, and God seeing the part of His creation that was meant to be the best part and His favorite part turn out to be the absolute worst part. He kind of has every right to throw it out, doesn't He? Right. Like if you bought a dog and all it did was bite your kids, how long would it last? Yeah. That's us, apart from Christ. So this is why it's so insane, the humility of Christ here, that Jesus Christ looking at a world and the Father looking at a world full of things that are not meeting his right expectations at all, and really that we don't, he doesn't owe us much, having made us, that he would decide to drop his expectation of perfection and instead ramp up his willingness to pay a cost to save us. And Paul is worshiping, he's trying to get his church to, to be like Jesus, and he's just worshiping Jesus, and I want and, and what he's saying is that when Jesus was, came to rescue us, he had a mindset of embracing humility, of paying a gigantic cost, of foregoing what he deserved as far as glory and honor, dropping his expectations in order to glorify his Father and save us, and in return he gets glorified. But this is his heart. And Paul says that this is a mindset. It's a mindset that Christ had that is ours in him, that Jesus gifts to us that he says, have the same mindset. Yeah, you'll never be God. You'll never have lived forever. Anybody here existed forever? No, okay, so you won't get there. And you can't make everything. But you can still have the mindset of God, Paul's saying. You can still think like God, even if you won't have the power of God. You can still think like him. And so he gives us this mindset. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be clutched onto. He dropped his expectation and embraced cost, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. It was a good idea when this started, and now it's a little irritating. And being found, there we go, in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death in the cross. And as I understand it, Paul's even thinking through this like he didn't just do one big humility. First, he he, uh, he emptied himself by becoming a servant. That's a human being. A human being by nature is made to be a servant of God. That's our purpose, to serve God. That's, That's what we are. Like your cell phone is a cell phone. It's made to text, which is funny. We call it a phone, but who talks on their cell phone anymore? Nobody unless it's an emergency or you're calling the government or something that's really low tech. But he starts off by emptying himself of his glory. That doesn't mean that he's not God anymore. That doesn't mean he's any less God. It means that he's dropping his glory. He's concealing it for a bit. I don't know. That's difficult to describe. He's first found in human form, but did he become, did he come as a great king? Did he come, be, come as shining in glory and covered in gold and everyone bowing down to him? No, he came as a servant in human form and there, then he even humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. So here's Jesus. He is in the form of God. He's equal with God, but he embraces obedience to God 
even to the point of death. So first he becomes, becomes a man, which is already unthinkably humble. And then he becomes an obedient dying servant, which is already unthinkably humble. And then the third, the cherry on top of abject humility, is that he dies on a cross, which was the most painful and humiliating way to die in Jesus' time. I think I've said this before, but I'll remind you, the Romans, who were the kind of rulers of the world at the time, they saved crucifixion for their worst enemies. You had to be an insurrectionist, somebody who tried to overthrow the government, or a slave in order to get crucified. But Roman citizens, it was against the law to crucify a Roman citizen because it, they considered that it would degrade all Romans if you ever crucified a Roman. It was just so humiliating, so degrading, that it would dishonor every single it would be like, you know, if you crucified a Canadian and all of us were like, that's an insult to all Canadians that you would even crucify one Canadian. No matter what they did, you could never do that. It's too degrading. And so here is Jesus becoming a man and then becoming an obedient man to death and then becoming obedient even to the most degrading event that could possibly happen to a human being. That's pretty high cost. And that's pretty pretty huge dropping selfish expectation, isn't it? And thus we're saved. So I started off this, this massage with talking about that moment when I realized that I had been kind of evangelistically treating someone better than some of the people I live with. And it just makes me, it's making me want to reevaluate many of my relationships thinking about this thing from cost and expectation cost. And it's not simple, right, to do this because there are some expectations that are valid high expectations. Like when I get on an airplane, I want that pilot to be doing a, an awesome job. There's no grace. Like you need to know what you're doing or get off the plane or we're all going to die. You know what I mean? There are some, you want your, your mechanics on the airplane. I don't want you to fudge anything. I don't want you to use the wrong lube or try to tighten that bolt with the wrong wrench. I have super high expectations because I want to go home. So I'm, that's just one illustration, but I'm not talking about those kinds of expectations, which are really valid expectations. You know, that people should not be intoxicated behind the wheel of a car, that people should drive well. Those are valid expectations of people. But I'm kind of talking about those selfish expectations that I can have where I want people to act and think and behave in a way that makes my life easier, period. Right? And I, you get tired of paying costs for people sometimes. Like, you ever heard that saying, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times? I don't know like the saying. Nobody ever says it. It must have been big in like the 1800s or something like that. But I just think, you know, sometimes maybe if someone's a teacher, I'm making this up. But I've come from a long line of teachers, so um, I've heard the story. You know, you've got that kid in your class that it's, it's the third month where you've told them every day to sit down. And every time you have to do that, your willingness to pay the cost for them goes down again, right? Um, or the, your 14th time getting up with your newborn in the night, your expectations that this is the last time goes up, and your willingness to get up one more time cheerfully goes down every time, right? Do you feel, can, can you see how you can kind of look through relationships and look at people through this lens of like, do I have really high expectations of you for wrong reasons, and have I given up on my willingness to suffer in Christ's name for you to be doing better in the Lord? Amen? Um, you know, this whole coffee thing, can I go there? Is that okay? I'm totally thinking about this. It's, can I give you like a, a, a pastoral view of these things? When you, when you get up and you say, hey, let's take care of the sanctuary and not drop coffee in it, there's, there's three groups of people every time. Whenever you do anything, there's three groups of people. There's a group of people who go, oh, thank goodness you finally said something because that coffee bugs me. There's that group of people. And then there's the, how dare you? I love my coffee and, and who cares about a few stains people? And then there's the people in the middle going, what are you talking about? And every single situation in church has those three people and it's all about which groups are the biggest and the smallest ones. That's what all you're doing. There's always people who don't care. There's always people who care. And there's always the one way and always people who care the other way and 
It's life. But I think our heart for it is this. I know that by paying a little bit of cost, I can contribute to the building staying great longer. By taking a little bit of trouble, by, by letting go of a few things for myself, I can help the building be a better experience for other people coming into the building. Amen? And at the t- same time, when we have guests coming, I can choose to have rock-bottom expectations of other people. I can choose to watch the biggest jumbo big gulp of, of double-double with cream and sugar go flying across the stage and with sizzling sparks coming off of someone's equipment. And I can go, I don't care. I can do both. I can choose to pay a little cost for other people's good and I can choose not to care at all if something goes wrong from somebody else so that they can have a better experience of Jesus. Amen? Does that make sense? And it, it's weird. It, it involves a little bit of like heart gymnastics, but I actually like trying to push my heart into new feelings. I like it. I'm, I know I'm a weirdo. Like, look at me. I'm not normal. I get it. How many, how many times have you seen this? You need to tug on the rope. Calm down, Rob. This is, this is on, on the internet. Um, I like to push my heart into new ways of feeling about things and new ways of looking things. Oh, hey, I'm about to talk about the Bible. For the, sake, <laughs> for the sake of believing Scripture better, for the sake of growing, I, I like doing that sometimes. Uh, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I have high expectations and they don't get met and I get upset, frustrated, feel abandoned, feel lost. Sometimes I have way too little willingness to pay a cost and you start to grumble and you're not gentle and... And that's what happens. How do you tell if you're, you're done paying a cost? Well, you start getting frustrated and you're not very gentle and you're not very patient and you start to grumble. How can you tell that you've got really high expectations that aren't being met? Well, it's probably going to show itself through unforgiveness or something like that or bitterness of spirit, which are all things that this letter talks about, or loss of contentment. And I think, and I'm totally just talking about myself, I think one of the reasons I'm so grateful that, I think it was the Holy Spirit convicted me about this thing, is that it just dawned on me that it's so ludicrous for, for me to be willing to do so much for my brother, who I love, and he's wonderful. But I've, I've got people in my home who I've like covenanted before God to be good to, and who I've given birth to. And I wasn't being on mission with my love for them. Does that make sense? This was the thing. It's just like, it's like that dagger from the Lord of the Rings. I got the Nazgul dagger right in the gut. And there's a little tip that's still in there. And I'm going to feel it until I go to the Grey Havens. And I've just nerded out a little too far for some of you, but it's okay. It's worth going back to the first book until you find out what I'm talking about. I actually don't want to get unconvicted of this. Maybe that's all of what I'm saying. I don't want to get past being convicted about this. Um, And again, that's not giving up right expectations. Right? Because God doesn't give up right expectations. He finishes this passage about how Jesus gave up everything in order to win people who deserve nothing. And then it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now also in as in my presence, also in my absence, excuse me, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So even as a Christian now, even though I'm under grace and I'm forgiven by, because of the blood of Jesus and I'm going to live forever, it's not like God's given up all his expectations. He expects me to uh, learn to work out my salvation. He expects me to grow in my obedience to Christ and his word. And these are good expectations coming from a loving father. So don't hear me saying, I'm a Christian and now nothing matters anymore. Because that's not the whole story. God God gave up his right to expectations and ramped up his willingness to suffer in order to save me. But it's not good for me to think that there are no rules. All that that does is make me ramp up my expectations and drop my willingness to pay cost for all of you. 
or whoever I live with or whatever. That's not actually God's heart in salvation. His heart is to make me and us as much like him as we can get in this life. And that's why the next verses say, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent children of God. That's the heart. Guys, do you know, do you know part of the reason why Jesus loved us and saved us? So that we could become children of God, which is what we are, and then so that we could also act like it more and more with joy and freedom, which is a good thing. Amen? So let's go back to this thing. Paul starts this section here saying, so is there any encouragement in Christ? This is where we need to start. I think when you start talking about relationships, maybe it's just me, one of the things that can happen right away is you can start feeling where there's something missing so that you can't do this. Does that make sense? I would love to do this, but I feel empty. I would love to do this, but I feel hurt. I would love to do this, but you don't know what my night was like. I would love to do this. And I totally get that, and that's very human. But that's why Scripture starts here. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation or fellowship in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, he starts there and says, then do this stuff. Because this is meant to be the overflow that change comes out of. We have Christ. Are you encouraged? And if you're not feeling the encouragement in Christ, start there. We're in Christ. Are you comforted by his love? If, if that's not a truth, start there. Start with Jesus. Are you experiencing the fellowship of the Spirit? and affection and sympathy from God. If that's empty, that's where you start. One of the most frustrating things is to be a Christian trying to tr change without starting with the truth of God's fellowship, love, and comfort, and joy. Do you want to be frustrated? Try to have the mind of Christ while you feel empty of God. because then you'll just feel like it's loss on top of loss instead of going down to gain, starting from riches, willing to lose some earthly riches because you've already got heavenly riches so that you can gain even more heavenly riches. So let's start there. And then from there, I invite us to consider our relationships with these terms of cost and expectation and be willing to change our minds. Now, you might be hearing, sitting here going, I thought about this. I sometimes imagine I'm in the audience too, and then I get frustrated with the message and I stop. That's a joke. I think someone could have an immediate knee-jerk reaction and think, number one, they could get discouraged and say, yeah, I'm always not willing to do the costs and I always have high expectations and start feeling down on yourself, and I w would want to challenge you and say, I don't, that's probably not true. If you think about your life, there are probably people or some kinds of people that you actually already have a lot of grace for and can put up with a lot of stuff because you want good for them. It could be kids, it could be old people, it could be family members, it could be non-family members. Some people just love strangers. You know, I have a fondness for truck drivers, I don't know why. I do. I was getting my car checked out at a shop this week, and there was this car, truck driver from Texas there, and he got the privilege of being the only person in like five years that I had a conversation with at, at the sh store. I usually just put on my phone and, and start to work, and I, he started talking, and I was like, this guy's a truck driver. <laughs> and he just kept going and talking about the con coronavirus and other things and some crazy drivers and I just loved chatting with this guy and even though he said some stuff that most Canadians would think wasn't PC I didn't care I like truck drivers <laughs> and I'm just saying that because it's a surprise I don't understand why but whenever they start talking or telling their stories I'm just so fascinated
Weird, huh? I never saw that one coming, but it's a reality. So even if you might feel a bit discouraged, I bet you there's already someone or some people in your heart that God actually has opened your heart up to be very Christ-like towards from the inside out. So don't be discouraged, and you can grow. The other good warning, I think, is that sometimes you can look at this, and you know, if you're like me at all, you look at a message that says you might not be doing good at something, and you want to assume right off the bat that you're already doing good because it's already been a hard week, and you don't want to feel convicted about anything, so I'm just going to assume I'm doing great. I'm totally a kind of person who pays high costs and is not and has low expectation for people. And I can think of myself that way because I'm often easygoing about a lot of things compared to some people, but there are definitely situations where I'm not like that. And those are the important situations. There are definitely situations where I can have really high expectations of people or circumstances and very low willingness to endure or persevere and stuff for God's glory. And for me, that's, the, that's where I'm trying to concentrate and go, okay, what's going on there? What's the root cause? I'm not like that because I trust the Lord for that situation. I'm not like that because I'm walking closely with the truth of God or in the Spirit. So, Lord, help me understand what's going on. Amen? Amen. Now, let's wrap this up and put it in a bow and tie it all together like a guy in chains. Um, I... I think this is a heart message and this is about like how you feel and how you think and how you treat people, which is good. But I, I'm, I'm sowing this seed in faith that this is going to help us to do what God's calling us to in the new building because I think a lot of what's going to happen is going to be a lot more missional. However that might work. It might be person off the street missional and it might be training and helping people go to unreached people group missional. But this is going to be a big part of it. All of us, for Jesus' sake and because we know him, willing to pay more and more cost and to drop selfish expectations so that other people can experience Christ. Whatever it ends up looking like. And we've got ideas. You know, did you know, you know, it was like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we had four different people who aren't Calvary Chapelites asking for free offices at the new building. Like four different ministries saying, I hear that you guys are giving away offices for free. And I'm like, where'd you hear that? But I think it's the Lord. It's like four different ministries that all do missions that are looking for a home in the new building. And we're praying it through and seeing what God has. And part of it would be, okay, so how can you help our church love what you're doing? Sometimes it'll be families, broken families, and it might be people without Bibles. Who knows what it is? But before we're even in there, God's sending us missional people looking for a home. And I I just, for me, what God's talking to me about is, yeah, you can prepare your heart by being, thinking about costs and expectations and trying to get your willingness to pay a price and your, where your expectations are to line up with where they should be in as many situations as possible. Amen?